Hello and welcome to the latest edition of our new series, Planted Unearthed. My name's Sam Peters and I'm one of the founding partners at Planted, a contemporary design show aimed at reconnecting cities with nature. As part of the Planted Unearthed series, we're exploring how design, sustainability, food and nature can combine to create cleaner, greener, better looking urban spaces. We're looking in depth at how we can reconnect with nature, speaking to some of the most innovative and respected thinkers in this field. Today we speak to renowned craftsman and designer Sebastian Cox, who along with his wife Brogan recently published a 15,000 word document entitled Modern Life from Wilder Land, a Manifesto for Nature First Land Use and Resource Use. Deb, welcome to Planted on Earth. Thank you for having me, good morning. Oh, it's great to have you on. What a fantastic uh, scene you've got there behind you. It looks <laughs> where, where are you at the moment? Uh, so I'm in uh, Lincolnshire at uh, my mum's house. I've been up here since the beginning of lockdown. And uh, at the bottom of the garden, there's this amazing old orchard, which is full of heritage apple trees. Well, only a few left now, um, but there's a lot of cow parsley and long grass. And uh, I'm sat on a bench that I made. I'll just show you quickly. So this is a bench <laughs> that I made out of locally, uh, uh, locally sourced larch from a nearby timber yard. And uh, I thought we wanted a platform to sit on in amongst the long grass. Um, so yeah, I thought this is the best place to call you from. It looks fantastic. It looks like you're actually in in the inside the meadow itself. So you've got a great advantage yeah. of what's well, going on. I'm a big proponent of not mowing grass. So I thought actually let's make a piece of furniture that really celebrates the idea of sitting amongst it, and actually that long grass is a is a is a great thing rather than just needing a lawn. It looks it's wonderful. So very very smart move. So I think that's uh, he's got, a, got got one of the best views in the house there. Clearly, in an <laughs> uh, so thanks so much for talking to us. We're really grateful for having you on today. I mean, um, clearly your work in in the world of of, of um, craft design and and the, the woodwork that you you've become renowned for um, is something that a lot of our audience would would be aware of. Perhaps perhaps something that has really um, projected your name in recent weeks and, and, and months has been this, this fantastic piece of work that you've done around how the future should look and how we should look to live our lives. Can you, can you talk to us a little bit about how the, the genesis of this, this manifesto that you've written? Yeah, um, I, suppose, I suppose it came about because um, we have always been interested in sustainability and just kind of doing a better job of living on this planet and um it's such an enormous subject it's so huge i started an exercise with brogan actually saying what do we really what really concerns us as a business and a brand and where can we even make a difference and i think when you start to ask those questions and you start to categorize things and almost segment your you know if you think about you know, the, 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 the mother earth is a key stakeholder in your business. And how do you satisfy the different needs of the segments of mother earth needs? And so, you know, there was a lot of talk at the time around ocean plastic and that was almost talked up to be like the biggest issue. And I remember thinking at the time, gosh, it's interesting how that's gained so much more traction than say, you know, atmospheric carbon or biodiversity loss. And I sort of was thinking with Brogan around the idea of what do we care more about and what actually really matters to us and what, what are the big issues? So we started writing it down and it just sort of ended up spiraling out of control <laughs> into this, into this uh, quite long document, which uh, started to basically really stretch our ambitions because we started to think, well, well, actually, let's design a vision of Britain. Let's design a vision of our own country and let's actually explain how it could work by doing research and finding out some facts and figures around you know whether it's plausible or possible because it's very easy to propose things but actually i always think the most exciting things are those that that can be proven to work by example which is where the the read you know the sort of realm of kind of you know graduate design and the, the really invigorating ideas that are coming out there are always most exciting when they feel scalable hmm. so um so yeah it came from there really and um I mean, I grew up in the countryside, so did Brogan. Her grandfather was a pig farmer. My dad and his, grandf and his father were um, mixed, uh, you know, traditional mixed small farmers. Um, so we were very connected to the countryside, very connected to, you know, the growing of food. And obviously we're also, through our business, we work only with British wood and we have our own woodland. So we are connected to the growing of resources. So we sort of brought this whole thing together in a, in a sort of a... a, a a document made up of lots of secondary research. We didn't do 
any primary research ourselves. You know, we weren't going to go out with our trundle wheels around the UK measuring fields and stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, it came together in that. And uh, it, it's really helped us kind of shape our direction and what, where we're going and channeling our energy and thinking about all of, you know, how practically we think we can have an impact on the world. And what sort of feedback have you got, especially from outside of the design industry, where perhaps you're not so well known, but what, what, what's been the response to this? Yeah, it's been an extraordinary response, actually. We've, we've printed a thousand in the first run thinking that we'd, you know, that last us five years or something. And, and, and we're already, you know, uh, having to print another load. So um, it's been amazing. And um, uh, I, I, I mean, obviously, a lot of people have read this during lockdown, so we've had sort of messages and things, but we haven't had any kind of in-depth conversations. But I have had people stop me, uh, like in bakeries and stuff, and could sort of say, "Oh, you said, did you write the manifesto?" And, and that's amazing because I, I almost feel like maybe it's gone beyond my level of qualification. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but you know, I, I do put a big disclaimer in the front saying I'm not a scientist, etc. Um, and and we, you know, we've had people say, you know, I know. You know, whatever advisors in civil service would you speak to them and I, i've sort of flatly said i'm really sorry but there are more qualified people to speak to speak to policy makers about that um uh so it's been really good we've we've connected with a lot of farmers and a lot of growers and a lot of food producers which has been the really interesting part for me uh learning more about all of the sort of small projects out in that world that are kind of really really exciting and interesting um and, uh, and sort of getting to spend time, you know, walking around a farm with someone who's doing it right and seeing how the subtle differences can make massive difference. Mm. Um, so it's been a really great response. And, um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm really pleased we did it. I mean, one of the, the few books I've found time to, to read during lockdown with a, a three-year-old running around our house and, uh, and a business to run with my wife as well has been Isabella Tree's book, Wilding, which is mm. proving to be something of a sort of seminal book, I, I think. Um, and, and, and this amazing news recently um, about the, the white storks that have, have, have bred for the first time in, in the yeah. wild uh, for hundreds of years. It's a really incredible story and kind of, tangible evidence of, of the work that her and her team are doing. I mean, how much of an influence has that had on, on your work? And I know your parents had probably a similar experience to, to, to her situation, didn't they, in terms of in the scaling up of, of farming and, and the challenges that it presents. To yeah, uh, absolutely. That, that book um, has, is, will be looked back on as one, a book that I think shifted public mood. I mean, I also think that there was there was a few other nudge factors um but that it's the way that and you know i said this a moment ago it's the way that that is such a tangible example of how it can work you know mm -hmm. actually franz vera um wrote the original kind of theory behind that um mm -hmm. which isabella tree quotes in her book and that's very extremely interesting book um but it's the way that it's brought together on an estate in sussex that mm -hmm. was an intense arable farm and it just makes the whole concept of letting the land go uh you know it's such a fantastic um example of, of how that works so well and you know the the stork the stork white stork project the, the you know the first in 600 years i mean that's just a, a, another amazing credit to the whole project and i believe they've had a license granted for beavers now wow which is going to be even even more interesting to see how reintroducing that another species that you know it was extinct here I think 350 to 400 years the beaver's been gone um bringing that back and seeing the impact that can have just letting the land go letting the animals that live there and need to live there uh benefit the other animals uh it's just going to be amazing to see so it's been a massive influence on me um as, as you say my dad you know there was a sort of ramping up of intensification the farmers around him were ripping hedges out um in the 60s you know the great hedge rip um and uh they they just couldn't keep up i think it wasn't that there was a sort of a moral stance against it i think there was discomfort around all the you know use of increased use of chemicals and 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 the sort of homogenization of it but they just couldn't keep up and they went effectively you know i think by the time my grandparents retired my dad decided that it wasn't a viable business for him to continue and that's what happened to a lot of farms that did you know mixed a mixed farm so he had fruit he had pigs you know as a bit of arable 
Um, but what's so fantastic is to see that stuff come back, you know, see, see people, particularly young people who are leaving cities, you know, escaping London and then buying a farm in Wales and rearing pigs in a woodland. You know, it's the, the, it, the stories like that, that I find so exciting. I mean, in terms of the, um, the manifesto itself, uh, I'd like to just explore and understand and, and um, sort of pair back. How, what's the plan around it? What are you trying to, how, how deliverable is it? Um, you talked about not wanting to engage with civil servants, but you know, any, any of us who've been involved at any point in our lives with campaigning of any sort, eventually it gets to a political level if it's, if it's got something behind it. And clearly what you've written does have a lot of depth to it and it's, it's connected with a lot of people just as Isabella Tree's work has as well. But uh, do, do you want to go to that level or do you have any interest at all in sort of, you know, actually making this happen? Um, I, for me, so I believe that uh, I'm a big believer in consumer power. And for me, it was always intended as a consumer guide. Um, I run a business and it's often seen that business is the, is the, uh, you know, the, um, the enemy of pro progress within sustainability. Um, and my, I'm absolutely determined to prove that that's not the case by running my business in the best possible way. Um, so really, I, I, I would leave it to, you know, some of the larger, more um, politically literate organisations to tackle the true campaigning uh, around the subject. Um, uh, for me, it was, it was very much about saying uh, consumers make a difference businesses make a difference and when you connect the two when you connect the consumers who have the right will and the businesses who are doing the right thing it can have a very powerful effect and the, frankly you know i used to sort of in my 20s you know, quite interested in the idea that maybe we need a new system of capitalism and and uh, to be quite honest we're running out of time we we don't have time to overthrow capitalism we've got to make this one work <laughs> yeah. so nor do i really want the i think it'd be a bit messy to overthrow capitalism actually um fair, yeah. so, yeah, to, uh, probably understatement <laughs> um but so so really for me it's a cute consumer guide it's how can we better consume so um it, you know it, in terms of that it's about we, i mean we, we our, our sort of ongoing activity with it is that we we're holding supper clubs we're not anymore because of coronavirus um, but, uh, you know, it's a, it, we offer like opportunities to engage with it and, uh, engage with the conversations around it through, uh, the, either the supper clubs that we're hosting or the bodies of work that we're putting out, which we, you know, um, it's all sort of paused at the moment, but we, you know, we're showing with, with galleries and things like that, trying to get, um, our work in our message out there as much as possible. Um, but I feel like what we're saying in the manifesto isn't unique to us. It's, it's very much like one voice of many. And um, I hope it doesn't sound like I'm shirking responsibility here, but I, I just don't feel qualified to go and talk to a select committee about agroecology <laughs> or any of those things. I'll, I'll quote you on that in a couple of years' time. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, that will come back to bite me, won't it? Exactly. Um, yeah. but, I mean, you, you've talked about farmers. You're from farming stock yourself. Um, I mean, it's clearly very important, however, this journey and the momentum that's, that's so evident now behind this kind of rewilding movement, um, it's important that everyone feels included, isn't it? And everyone can go along on the, on the journey together rather than sort of demonising anyone or kind of saying this is, you know, yeah. you, you are to blame, I guess. I mean, that, 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 is that part of this, that it's got to be a kind of collective will? Uh, oh, gosh, absolutely. I mean, carrots not sticks is, yeah. is the way that we we have to tackle this whole subject um you know and again i think i think this there's a there's a real issue around the idea of um homogenizing you know farmers you know like as if they're all one one type of like they're all signed up to the same you know political organization or whatever that's yeah. they're an incredibly diverse bunch uh of, of people doing different things i mean even in the way that the the, the area of the country that they operate will completely affect you know the, the food that they produce and all of those sorts of things so it there are lots and lots of people within the farming community who um are doing really good things and want to do good um it just strikes me that um there has become a kind of normal culture put in place and if you ask any farmer you know why do you spray your crops or whatever you know the answer would be well because you buy food that 
has spray on it. You know, that's uh, uh, it's it's all driven by consumption. It's driven largely by what supermarkets think people want to buy. But the easy way to feed back and inform what supermarkets uh, understand that you want to buy is to buy the organic stuff or the the stuff that you know you 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 really believe in. And I do find it strange when people talk about you know um, biodiversity crisis or whatever, uh, and they're eating a plate of you know. Um, not organic peas or, or whatever it is you know it we, we all have to take personal responsibility for this and particularly i think that's the thing that i find so interesting about food um compared with designed objects is that we literally consume food every single day every single day we're making that choice it is the essence of our life and it is the essence of wildlife because so much of our land is dedicated to the production of it so yeah it's um it's uh it's very important not to all tar farmers with the same brush and understand that there are a lot that are trying to do different and if we just encourage them with our wallets uh there'd be many many more who who would be you know doing doing better clearly, clearly consumer choices um can can change the the supply and and what what we're offered i mean what what do you say to people though who would say well it's okay for for us if you're you're living in a you know relatively affluent lifestyle you've, you've, you've got a degree of privilege privilege and you you have choice by definition but what mm. what about people who are really struggling i know it's a question asked so much of people but how can people who are struggling to make ends meet choose to buy more expensive products essentially i mean it's, it's how do we kind of close that loop yeah well here's where we get into politics um because really? <laughs> yeah because i i believe that that food should be subsidized i feel i believe that i, I believe that um governments should recognize that actually cheap food is expensive in the long run um and you know expensive to our environment expensive to our health um and actually uh you know we food is just too cheap it is um, you know and it's so easy to say that you mm -hmm. know uh which is why i believe that political intervention is important in this point because it's no good saying food is too cheap to someone who can't afford to buy the cheap stuff. Um, but that's where that, and, and I don't mean, you know, it's not like a subsidy in terms of, you know, some sort of benefit system paid into the bank account of, of people who, as a food subsidy, but maybe it's just subsidized on the shop shelf. So sure. there, it, it should not be the case that organic should be more expensive no. than chemically produced. Chemically produced food should be penalized and taxed to the point where that price is increased. And the organic should be subsidized with the taxes received from uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the chemically produced food. So it's that, that, that is a bit where I, you know, yeah, maybe I, I, you know, take on a political stance with it. And it's not entirely down to consumers. But those that can should is my yeah. view. So, you know, I, um, uh, I, 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 it's been a long time since I read my own manifesto. <laughs> I, I haven't got around to it in lockdown. But the, I, I do put... A, I did some maths around it, uh, around the sort of top tax bracket uh, income uh, in the UK and, and how disproportionately that marries up with organic food, which tells you that those who can aren't. So I think 1.5% of food sales in the UK are, are, are organic, or it's, it's certainly less than 5%. And I think something like 15% of incomes um, are in a, an upper level tax bracket. So there's a lot of people being paid well in the UK who aren't buying the food that makes a difference. So I think that's really interesting. And I, I think I did a further bit of calculation. I'm sorry if I'm misquoting myself. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but um, uh, you know, I think if everyone in that, in that upper tax bracket bought organic food, you would have an area of farmland equivalent to a, a national park in the UK, uh, all organically farmed. So it can be done. Uh, it, a, a difference can be made through consumption right now to make a full difference. Yes, maybe we need political intervention there. Well, that's a really interesting take. And I'll, in, in the interest of steering you away from politics, uh, Seb, I'll <laughs> ask you a slightly more simple, a straightforward question, I guess. But, you know, for, for people, we're, we're really interested at Planted at how people who live in urban spaces can kind of connect in with the kind of world that you're, you're in at the moment, the beautiful bird song in the background, the wonderful meadow that you're sat in, and no doubt all sorts of wonderful insects and creatures crawling around uh, under, your, under your very feet. Um, I mean, can you give a kind of view of, in the short term, if people are starting to understand what, what this movement, if I could call it, is talking about? Um, uh, how can people who say live in a in a small flat in, in 
inner city London or Birmingham, you know, get a get a piece of, of what you're experiencing at the moment and, and what you're talking about, in, in fact. Yeah, so, um, well, that's really simple, I think, um, because, it, you know, London is a very green city. So, or, uh, you know, I'm not sure about the statistics for Birmingham or other cities, but certainly London has lots of parks. And, you know, this is not a particularly special place. The only thing that makes this place special is the fact that my stepdad hasn't mown it. You know, he hasn't slashed it down and tried to turn mm. it into a lawn. And that makes it magic. So um, I, I have written about in the past, you know, the importance of not mowing. Um, particularly up until July at least um, and doing that in public spaces would have an enormous benefit to cities. Um, uh, Can you the, explain why? I mean what, what to, in simple terms why? Yeah so um, Plant Life did a study uh, earlier in May. Plant Life are a fantastic charity around uh, road verges in particular mm -hmm. and they found that um, uh, biodiversity within an area of grass even if it's a lawn can be increased by tenfold by not mowing in the month of May. It's as simple as that. So what happens is we're obsessed with flattening grass to within an inch of its life and other flora that lives amongst grass take a little longer to grow than grass. So if you slash it down, of course you slash down absolutely everything and you never know the wildflowers that might be living in your lawn or in your park. And I've seen this in my park because actually I think due to council government cuts, my park nearby in London, they didn't cut it until May last year and late May and the wildflowers that came up were unbelievable and when you have wildflowers or I mean even just weeds actually let's be really clear I, I don't advocate pictorial planting I literally just advocate the, the you know docks cow parsley whatever whatever comes up um, the insect life in our park is is huge you know you, you can hear the hum uh, over mm -hmm. the top of the road when you when you lie down in our park and it's a small ordinary park in Deptford in London um, and obviously the benefit to biodiversity is massive uh, there's lots of birds in our park we've got goldfinches and um, <clears throat> all, all kinds of you know interesting suburban birds um, and 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 the, the insect life is, is enormous and that biodiversity boost is not only good for nature but it's also really good for us because the you know the things that you can notice if you take the time as a lot of people have found during lockdown taking the time to see this stuff I, I'm, I'm skeptical of the idea that there's more nature around now. I think this is maybe a little bit, but actually I think people are just seeing more because mm, um, I see a lot of nature in London around our park where we live. I see so much and I record it on my Instagram and post about it. So um, yeah, I think, I think it's very, very easy to access what I have because all I have here behind me is an unknown bit of, bit of, you know, scrappy land. Well, it looks great. And um, I guess, maybe a lesson for all of us be, be a bit less tidy and uh, and just see what see what comes up i think that's it i think i think that's exactly the essence of isabella tree's book which we mentioned earlier um it's about changing the mindset um of of us you know it's 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 our problem all of this you know we we are completely preoccupied with clipping hedges within an inch of their life and mowing roadside verges we don't need to do that we just don't need to it's actually it's a waste of petrol it's a waste of time it's a waste of money and actually, it doesn't really benefit in any way. All right, I get it if you want a cricket pitch or yeah. you want a football pitch. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm a big fan of cricket. I don't want to see Lords free wild. But, like, but, you know, there's time and place. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. But, um, you know, there, there is a provision. You know, there should be a provision at the edges of all parks for, you know, a little curved area, a little headland of just, of just, just left to do what it wants. And I guess maybe one way of doing it, some sort of compromise, because I certainly grew up obsessing about lawns and how neat and trim they looked and nice straight lines. And I've completely come over to your way of thinking um, But maybe you could have a patch of the lawn. Just try it out. Just just leave the lawn and, and see what happens in one little corner. And yeah. You might, might find it a magical experience to see what what comes up and what inhabits it. And, and it totally changes the dynamic of a garden, doesn't it? Absolutely. And what, what, cause, because one of the things that's, that's really good about lawns is because generally they have been mown a lot, the nitrogen gets removed all the time. So you, you mow it and you take away the clippings and you dump them somewhere else. You're constantly extracting the nitrogen. And that's actually very good for wildflowers. Wildflowers don't do very well in rich areas. So it's no good sowing a rich area with wildflower seeds. They won't survive. You need to keep extracting that nitrogen. So you will be surprised at the, at the, the presence of, of wildflowers and how well they do. And if you're lucky enough to paddock out the back or whatever, um, my advice would be so uh, uh, a, a, a um, wildflower called Meadowmaker.
um, which is a fantastic parasitic wildflower, and it will convert your um, your uh, your sort of rich pasture into um, into a wildflower meadow in a few years. Well, that's a, a lovely tip to to end this conversation on. Uh, Seb, thank you so much. I really could have spoken to you for for hours on this, and uh, no doubt in the future we'll we'll be able to do that uh, face to face. But incredibly grateful for you to cut for coming on. Um, congratulations on the manifesto. Congratulations on finding such a fabulous place to, to lock down as well. Um, <laughs> I think your work's very, very important, um, and uh, more and more people are recognising that as well. So uh, thank you for your time. Um, so if, if you've enjoyed uh, today's series of Planted on Earth, please subscribe to our YouTube YouTube channel. Easy for me to say. Details of which can be found at our website www planted-cities.co.uk and um, we've got more great content to come in the next few weeks including interviews with the founder of River Cottage and high profile sustainability campaigner Hugh Fernley Whittingstall um, but for now it's thanks again to Sebast Sebastian and thanks to you for watching this has been Planted on Earth. Sebastian thanks very much. Thank you very much. All the Good best. To you. Thanks so much for your time. Bye.